We could talk for hours about gaming in the 90s, or at least we could if we weren't still getting our breath back from a whole decade spent blowing into game cartridges. But who can blame us when this particular era of gaming produced so many incredible games and bizarre trends, whole new genres and bitter rivalries, and enough tons of weird plastic peripherals and free cover disc CDs to fill many landfills, which they undoubtedly currently are doing. Here are the things every 90s gamer will remember. If you was born in the noughties, just try and relax and don't strain your liver or kidneys. We have first dibs on those. A bit hotter, a bit cooler, a bit weird, a bit more revolutionary, a bit more Mario, a bit more of what you want. It's 16-bit, and it's yours only if you get new Super Nintendo. Now you're playing with power, super power. Educators researching mathematical skill over the 20th century would surely notice a weird spike in the 1990s when everyone suddenly got really good at their 8 times multiplication table. The reason, of course, will be familiar to anyone who was playing games in the 90s, when the enormous surge in home computer technology meant that consoles were doubling in power every few years, an increase that we measured exclusively in bits. Brand new 16-bit Super Nintendo with Super Mario World, wow! At the start of the decade, the lousy 8-bit consoles of the 80s were being supplanted by ones rocking 16-bit processors, such as the Super NES or Mega Drive, aka Sega Genesis. Yes! Which in just a few years got bested again by the likes of the 32-bit Sega Saturn and PlayStation, which in turn looked like pathetic baby consoles next to the Nintendo 64 in 1996, so named for its unconquerable 64-bit CPU, capable of rendering the most realistic Sean Bean yet. But what actually are bits? Well, off the top of my head, in computing, bits refers to word size. A word is a fixed size piece of data handled as a unit by the instruction set or the hardware of the processor. I'd love to go into more detail, but I'd have to look it up. Okay, fine, we didn't know what bits were, but in fairness, neither did anyone else. So that's the new Super Nintendo Entertainment System. What about it? They say it has 16-bit technology, whatever that means. It was just the easiest metric by which to measure the state of the console wars that consumed the hearts and minds of every young gamer in the 90s. In retrospect, this system rivalry was a fairly cynical ploy by console makers with big advertising budgets to whip kids into a fervor of blind loyalty that, frankly, has taken two further decades to unlearn. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. But today I, a 90s PlayStation fan, am able to shake the hand of Luke here, who owned a Super Nintendo, and find common ground. Yeah, like hating an old Mega Drive Mike. <laughs> what an idiot. Didn't even have Mode 7. Stupid still. idiot. Sonic the Hedgehog. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop there. Head back to Pizza Hut and buy another stuffed crust pizza. You'll get another demo disc filled with more of the best PlayStation games, including Gran Turismo 2, Spyro 2, Ripto's Rage, Tomb Raider 4, Sledstorm, and the next Tetris. It's so sad that physical media is dying. Sure, Spotify is good, but does any music sound as sweet as the analog click that cues up a favorite mixtape? Oh, nuts. Does anyone have a pencil? One thing we really do miss about the 90s, though, is the reckless abandon with which software makers would put demo versions of their games on CDs, which made their way to you via countless ways, for instance being taped on the front of magazines, or given to you in exchange for buying one of the other great innovations of the mid-90s, stuffed crust pizza. So finish that stuffed crust pizza and leap into action. Once you get a taste of these games, you'll have to put them on your holiday gift list. The fact that you could get so many free game demos in exchange for buying a pizza is indicative of the extreme commonness of demo discs in the 90s, and the inexplicable lack of confidence that Pizza Hut had in stuffed crust that it thought it needed to lure you in with free Tony Hawks. You put cheese inside the crust, Pizza Hut. You made the sale. Of course, with freebie console and home computer demo discs flying at you from every angle, it wasn't long before your game collection included more demo compilations than actual games. But what the makers of those games didn't count on was that once we had the demo version of their game in our greasy pizza hands, there was often no need to shell out for the full thing. And they're underway. I mean, yeah, Daytona is great, but is it better than playing the demo over and over? The answer was yes, of course, but 50 bucks better? Which maybe you forgot is how much games cost in the 90s. About $85 today adjusting for inflation. That's roughly five stuffed crust pizzas in today's money. Economics that simply could not last. 
Besides, while the overabundance of free games on demo discs meant you could more or less play your way through the entire 90s without ever paying for a single game, it did mean your house was, and quite possibly still is, absolutely stacked with free VCDs with no way of shifting them. <laughs> Unless you can convince a collector, your copy of free 1999 Kellogg serial game Mission Nutrition is very rare and valuable. Well, I won't take a penny under 400. Well, I have a very interested buyer in Paris on the other line right now. <laughs> so, perhaps it. Oh, he's gone. These days, you don't need a manual to learn how to play a game. You just need experience, gut instinct, and the patience to sit through a two-hour tutorial. But back in the roaring 90s, every gamer knew that boning up on a new game by leafing through the enclosed manual was part of the adventure, for a number of reasons. First, in the front half of the decade, many console games didn't have the processing power to spare on any kind of story or cinematic. So usually the backstory to whatever game you were playing was contained entirely in the manual itself, shedding much needed light on whatever slim bits of storytelling were kept on the actual cartridge or disc. So if you wanted to know who your hero was, or why they were marching so determinedly left to right, you had to consult the manual. Plus, the game's manual had a very special role to play in 90s gaming. Just passing the time. You wouldn't think it would be possible to be bored in the 90s, bearing in mind how busy we all were cowering in fear from Furbies. But manuals were crucial for filling the time between getting hold of a new game, on Christmas morning for instance, and getting to actually play the damn thing. Frequently this meant waiting until nobody else you lived with was using the TV, and in these agonising hours, leafing through a brand new manual was a way to get a glimpse of the game to come. It seems weird now, but hey, it made the time go by. Plus, if you want the really, really good stuff, Flight Sim. The manuals for those things are enormous! They work perfectly well as doorstops, but if you fancy reading them as well, they had all the kind of technical details of how to fly the plane, it's all educational. I'm pretty sure by the end of it, you could, uh, you could probably pilot an F-19 stealth bomber all by yourself. If you didn't drop it on your toe first and completely remove the use of your right foot. Contact bearing 09417. Contact! So yeah, it was either that or finally try drinking my sea monkeys. And I didn't get bored enough to do that until 2002. No, no! Today the arcade is a large empty room where you can win minions in a claw machine and find out if you still remember the steps to Cotton Eye Joe on Dance Dance Revolution. Spoiler alert, you do, but your knees can't handle it. But back in the first half of the 90s, the arcade was on the bleeding edge of video games, for one simple reason. The games you could play in exchange for a steady stream of coins were way better than anything you could play at home. This was an era when many of the hottest games you got on home console were ported over from their chunky, five foot high arcade counterparts, and often looked absolutely rubbish in comparison. Sure, Killer Instinct on the Super NES was tolerable, but only in the arcade could you get the full graphical spectacle of a, a defeated Velociraptor being forced to dance. <laughs> you can do it, put Jurass into it. Because the games just looked so good, you couldn't resist pumping all your loose change into the arcades, hammering buttons with the jealous rage of a 90s gamer who knew they could never afford the only home console that looked as good as a full-size cabinet, namely the ludicrously expensive Neo Geo AES, which cost $650 at launch. That's nearly $1,300 in today's money. <laughs> In the second half of the decade, of course, home consoles could match arcade graphics, and 90s gamers got to be right there as interest in these brightly lit cathedrals of joystick twiddling declined. <laughs> Arcades kept drawing you back throughout the 90s, though, with one thing home consoles have never got quite right to this day. Increasingly ridiculous, recoil-enabled plastic light gun games. 
Take a Bow, House of the Deads 1 and 2, Silent Scope, Virtua Cop, and the Rapid Fire Gunblade, which rattled our hand bones from 1995 onwards. And it never did us any harm. King of them all was Time Crisis, which upped the stakes with a stampable foot pedal that, when pushed, caused you to spring out of cover. Which never felt right to me. Surely you should press the pedal to take cover. I could never make that make sense in my head. Now you know how I feel about inverting controls. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Deviant. But get real. You'd rather be playing video games. You can rent them from Blockbuster. They've got more of the coolest new Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and Sega Genesis games for rent than anyone in the world. 19th century anarchist Pierre-Joseph Proudhon famously said that property is theft. So were he alive in the 90s, he definitely would have had a Blockbuster card. Because, you'll doubtless recall, throughout the 90s, Blockbuster was the biggest rental chain on the planet. A place where you could pay a small fee to borrow movies on VHS instead of owning them for a lot more money. Welcome to Blockbuster Video! Back in the 1980s, Blockbuster won a court battle against Nintendo that meant it could continue renting out video games alongside movies. This meant that in the 1990s, video game rentals were still going strong, and you were merrily tripping down to Blockbuster or your local equivalent for borrowed electronic entertainment. Oh, plus they have all kinds of video games for the kids. Especially handy when you suspected a game might be, how can I put this, trash garbage. Back then, if you'd heard on the grapevine or read in a monthly games mag that a game was total bobbins, it didn't mean you wouldn't play it. Just that it was what reviews generally called, quote, a rental. This is brilliant. There is no way to play bad games now without paying full price for them. No one makes demos anymore because they know that they're more likely to make people not buy the game than buy the game. Uh, and everything else is full price. Rentals don't exist. So I remember going to Blockbuster and, uh, and getting Rise of the Robots on the SNES. I knew it was bad. I knew it was legendarily awful. I'd read about it in video game magazines, but I had to know for myself just how awful. The only good thing about Rise of the Robots was the handful of power chords that Brian May was brought into play during the intro. Um, and occasionally, uh, let's be fair, occasionally you rent a game and it was really good and then you go out and buy it anyway. Like I did with NBA Jam Tournament Edition, which I, I had no interest in basketball, which is why I rented it. But then it turned out to be a really good arcade game, so I bought it. Yeah! Blockbuster got so big that there were even some exclusive games that for a while you could only get there including the Western release of a Final Fight spin-off for the Super NES, one that focused on orange-suited brawler Guy and was titled Final Fight Guy. Confusing because Final Fight Guy is how I refer to everyone in Final Fight. And Double Dragon. And most of Streets of Rage. Game over? No way! Because we got Game Genie! We tell you when it's over. With Game Genie, I decide how many lives I get. I use it when I want to live forever. Play to the end and win. Maybe I want to start on level 15. No problemo! It makes cool games like Street Fighter 2 more exciting. That's frustrating! If there's one thing we loved about games in the 90s, it was the incredible box art. But if there were two things, it was finding new and creative ways to break our games. Luckily, this was made simple by the abundance of cheating devices on sale in the 90s, from Game Genie to Game Shark to Action Replay and several more. Just plug the replay into your PlayStation, Nintendo 64 or Sega Saturn and load your favorite game. On cartridge-based consoles, this chunky bit of code-injecting plastic would squat between your system and the actual game. From there, it would make tweaks to the game code to, for instance, give you infinite lives or ammo. And these tweaks could be a godsend in the heyday of Hard as Nails 90s video games. Go to any level, live forever. Game Genie, the radical video game enhancer. And when that got boring, cheat cartridges could be used to really fudge with your precious software. <laughs> that mysterious, inaccessible, barely visible island in the damn level of Goldeneye what secrets does it hold? Use a cheat cartridge to enable no clipping mode and uncover the dramatic truth. That there's nothing there whatsoever. But now we know! For many, these code-exploding cheat cartridges were a first glimpse at how games were put together. 
but always came with a frisson of danger too, who knew what unwanted consequences could come of messing with your favourite games. Like when I was halfway through Ocarina of Time and took my cartridge round a friend's house, where someone combined it with an action replay cartridge to see what cheats could be enabled. It made the game skip ahead to one of the final cutscenes, and when I panicked and turned off the power, well friend, it destroyed my save data entirely. But hey, did I cry about it? Yes. God, yes. In the analog days, many tech problems could genuinely be solved by smacking the broken device really hard. It's what engineers call the Fonzie resolution, probably. But you, a gamer of the 90s, don't need to be told how broken objects could be made to magically work with a little physical exertion. Because you, like everyone else with lungs and a games console, spent the decade blowing into the business end of your game cartridges to make them work again. What's truly spooky about taking a toot on your games to fix them is how somehow everyone on the planet knew to do it years and years before the internet became widespread. Watching a sibling or friend blow into their cartridges before starting up a game no problem was all it took to cement it in your mind as the ultimate fix. Except for the fact that, uh, it wasn't. Today, the prevailing wisdom is that blowing on cartridges didn't do anything after all, and it was simply that plugging in your games over and over gave them another chance at a solid connection, which is what made them work regardless of your huffing and puffing. What's worse, all that superstitious blowing into your games made them more likely to corrode thanks to the moisture in your breath. Tests have shown it, and Nintendo's advice is never to try it. Which leaves blowing into your cartridges a sobering reminder from the 90s of how fast misinformation can spread and how convincing it can feel. Oh, I wish I hadn't blown into this one now. Maybe I can suck the damage out. Oh, 90s dust. 16-bit arcade hits. It worked! My lungs are full of 90s dust though. It clearly it was, well, it was worth it. Need some weeks off work. This clearly works. Right, I can't wait to tell everyone I know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that folks. Shush Tetris. If you enjoyed this video and you can think of other things that every 90s gamer will remember, then why not pop them in the comments uh, for a massive nostalgia blast for everyone who is checking under the video. And if you did like this, then oh boy, do we have more videos for you? The answer is yes. Uh, here's another video from us. It's all about the dumbest things that you've got seriously attached to. And down here from outside Xbox, it's the three ways to play on Hitman in Segale. It's pretty cool. And if you did enjoy this, then why not subscribe? Thanks for watching. Bye.